This is Michael Livingood. I'm going to be reading again in just a moment from my book, The Wow Factor. I'm going to be reading a short chapter uh, called Case Study, Australia and Alabama. Uh, before I begin reading today, let me just mention again to you that uh, The Wow Factor is available for you uh, to purchase. You can get it on Amazon or you can go to our websites, uh, either MikeLivingGoodMinistries.com or DoorkeepersNewZealand.org. I want this to be in your library. I want it to help you as we believe God to send us significant revival. We've been reading the uh, chapters I've been reading to this point. I've been dealing with what is it that attracts the presence of God and uh, what is it that you begin to do to sustain. Well, I'm going to move along now to a kind of a new focus for the next few chapters. And we're going to talk about giving leadership to revive. We're going to start by doing some case studies and some revivals that I am familiar with and uh, some of the lessons learned from those revivals. As revival broke open in our lives and ministry, my wife and I determined to be students of revival. We not only added a number of books to our personal library, but we sat down with leaders whose churches were experiencing some level of revival. Initially, our conversations were of the, why is this happening in your church uh, nature? Later, we began asking, how do you sustain revival in your church? We even asked such pragmatic questions as, how did you know when to bring a series of revival services to a close? Shortly after we visited the Brownsville Revival, we were preaching meetings in northern Mississippi. We heard about a church in a small town in northern Alabama experiencing a revival. So we drove over for two services on the nights between our own services. I was told by the pastor of that church that in 15 weeks of revival services, 997 people responded to a salvation altar call. Close to 500 were filled with the Holy Spirit. This occurred in a church that averaged roughly 150 on a Sunday morning in a town of about 7,000. On a later drive through that community, I was able to spend time with the pastor. When I asked him what, in his opinion, led to this visitation from God, he observed two things. First, was the sovereignty of God. A sovereign God can do what He wants, where He wants, how He wants, and to whom He wants. On the human side, He put the revival down to hunger. He had a good friend in ministry who was related to a staff pastor at Brownsville. Before the revival broke at his church, he often accompanied this friend to that revival. Being in that revival, increased his faith and hunger for his own church and city. That hunger was expressed by a weekly 48-hour prayer meeting. The prayer meeting would begin on Friday morning and continue straight through until the Sunday morning worship began. This prayer meeting continued for a number of months before the revival exploded. It was shortly after visiting this revival that our first extended meeting broke open. At one point, I placed a call to the Alabama pastor to ask, how do you know when an extended meeting is over? He simply said, you and the pastor will know. Certainly, I have been in meetings where the voice of the Holy Spirit was incredibly clear. I am thinking of an instance when the Lord spoke to my heart and told me the pastor would ask me to extend the meetings and the answer was to be no. I did not understand that answer until four weeks later when I walked into the greatest spiritual explosion of my life. That same Alabama pastor gave me three things uh, that they looked at when the voice of the Spirit was not crystal clear. I have added one more. I have found these guidelines to be very helpful. First, ask yourself if the crowds are there. If the people are not coming, you can call it anything you want, but it is not revival. This does not mean you will always have increasing crowds, 
Most extended meetings have at least one night in the week that is a low attendance night. There is an ebb and flow in attendance. Even during revival, community events, school activities, and family happenings can all impact the crowd. Ask yourself, why is the attendance down? Do not panic at the first low night. You will probably rebound in attendance. Do not fear that the people will only remember the low nights at the end. Most will only remember the great nights. In cowboy language, ride the horse as long as you can. More mistakes are probably made by cutting a meeting off too quickly rather than extending it too long. The second question I was told to ask myself is, uh, do the results merit me asking the next per, uh, church or the next person to delay the scheduled ministry? This addresses the number of salvations, spirit baptisms, healings, and the like. This speaks as well to the changed lives. Thirdly, are the finances there? God will not bankrupt a church for the sake of a meeting. Neither will he bankrupt the evangelist for the sake of a meeting. He may stretch your faith now and then, but finances may be an indicator of where a meeting is at. The fourth indicator relates to the manifest presence of God. Is he there? You cannot dictate an awesome presence of God. The testimony from, Brown, from the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida, was they kept extending the meetings because they were afraid he might not keep coming and they did not want to miss the opportunity to be with him. Open heavens are often clear indicators to keep the meeting going. Certainly, open heavens are stronger than simple anointings. One more time, I want to emphasize the clear voice of the Spirit must take precedence. Some of the greatest results we have seen have come after we were tempted to shut down an extended meeting, but felt checked in doing so. Advice from an Aussie. In 2002, I was introduced to an Australian pastor who was seeing revival in his church. He was the guest speaker at a meeting for preachers I had attended just to be refreshed. I was told the revival in his church had run somewhere around four years at the time. Over lunch, I asked him what he felt were the keys to sustaining the move of God. In response to my question, he mentioned four things that seemed to be important. First, he talked about the sovereignty of God. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12 states that we see through a glass darkly. Sometimes we cannot be certain of the cause of revival. One church prayed for two and a half years and then revival came. Another pursued that same presence for 10 years before the longing of their hearts was satisfied. We can and should learn the principles of both attracting and sustaining the presence of God. At the same time, we recognize a sovereign God may not explain all his thinking before revival comes. Secondly, he spoke about faith. Many people are always believing God for something to be over. He said to me, Whenever you believe revival is over, then it is over. He determined to live in and encourage a positive, faith-filled attitude about revival in his church. He always believed this Sunday would exceed last Sunday. His third principle was the releasing of the prophetic in his church. I told him, he had just become a controversial figure for many pastors with that statement. Almost all pastors will agree to the role of God's sovereignty. Many will understand the importance of living by faith. The prophetic, however, can be scary. 
He indicated he could only speak for himself, but there was something about releasing the prophetic that seemed to sustain the revival for his church. In the years since that conversation, I have observed its basic truth, which should not surprise us, because the scripture points toward the prophetic as being a part of the last day's revival. His final principle was to lay hands on his people regularly. This may not have included every meeting, but they discovered something seemed to stir inside of people when hands were laid on them. The doctrine of laying out of hands was revived for many Pentecostals during the revivals at Toronto and Pensacola. Certainly, this teaching has experienced its share of abuses over the years. Yet I would suggest this pastor is accurate. Often, when the evangelist leaves town, the pastor goes back to church as normal. During the special meetings, people are prayed for almost nightly. But when those meetings end, often the laying out of hands is one of the first things to go. To be honest, sometimes it is because we preachers do not want to be embarrassed. Because nobody falls over when we touch them. One candid friend of mine served as an advisor for a charismatic women's ministry. Well, he is the best I have ever heard teach people on how to share their faith. People rarely fall to the ground when he prays for them. He candidly admitted that his prayer line was usually the shortest when he was asked to pray for people. We must move beyond first impressions. Let's allow our people to be prayed for on a regular basis and stir up what God is doing in them. Both of the above situations involve churches where I have never preached. I did attend the meetings in Alabama, but I have never been to the church in Australia. However, I have provided you with these two case studies because I have shared their principles with some of the churches where revival broke out and they found those principles were helpful on their journey.